today, on International Women's Day, we celebrate women's achievements all around the world. We are entering an exciting period in history in, where, in which the world expects balance. We notice its absence and we celebrate its presence. Legally speaking, things have never looked be better for women, but laws only tell part of the story. Women-owned firms are still in the minority, and women who have embraced entrepreneurship uh, experience a lot of di difficulties who are often very different than experienced by their male counterparts. To shed light to some of these disparities, today's panel discussion will host three inspiring businesswomen who will tell us about their experiences in female uh, management and leadership. What explains the gender pay gap? To what extent did they encounter a glass ceiling during their career? Should we strive for equal distribution of gender in management teams? Or, is, or are quotas the solution? In the following hour, we will hear the experiences and opinions of Cara Antoine, Chief Marketing and Operations Officer of Microsoft Netherlands. <laughs> Diana van Maasdijk, Co-Founder and CEO of Equally. And Karine van Meijer, Senior Investment Advisor at Future, Plans Cap uh, Future Planet Capital. So please give them a warm well, round of applause. So thank you for making time and your busy schedule for uh, being here today. Uh, in 2019, this year, the Netherlands celebrates 100 years of voting rights for, uh, for women. Do you believe that the Netherlands is an emancipated uh, nation? Karine. <laughs> Good question. I always think in, in the Netherlands is that we like to appear that we are very emancipated, but then when you actually <laughs> come down to the table at home, you see that there's still a lot of old-fashioned rules. And that's what we call the unconscious gender bias, and uh, that's something that I've been working very hard about. I studied at Harvard about 15 years ago, and I love being back in, the, you know, in this kind of environment, trying mm -hmm. to inspire young women and men to make these things conscious, because I think that we have a long way to go. There was a big article in the, New York, in the Financial Dagblad this morning about mm -hmm. that women still you know, need to really become much more financially independent, and that's because they're not aware of it yet. Do you agree? So what I think is surprising and really shocking, actually, uh, so I was born in 1969, but still in the 60s, women had to ask permission from their husband to buy a car, or to buy anything, really. Yeah and um, didn't have an opportunity to vote. And so I think, yeah, I'm 50 years old now, and so in the last 50 years, how far have we come? In many cases, we've come very far. But as Karine says as well, we still have a long way to go um, to uh, achieve equity um, in everything that we do and every opportunity that we have. Um, there's still a lot, more, a lot more work to do on that. Mm -hmm. And Diana, do you believe the Netherlands is an emancipated country? No, I, I don't believe no? that the Netherlands is yet reached uh, emancipation. I think on paper we have for many, many things. I think one of the most shocking uh, numbers of the Netherlands is that only 50% of Dutch women are financially independent. And I think that that then tells you exactly where we are at when it comes to uh, gender equality and the economy. Because it means that 50% of women have to ask someone else if they can buy a pair of shoes. I mean, that's pretty much what, you're yeah. what you get to. Um, but I think that things are moving along. And today, also on the newspaper, we saw that the Minister of uh, Emancipation has said that now companies in the Netherlands that don't reach 30% of women in the board of directors, that she will start naming them and who they are. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that we can start expecting to happen. Mm -hmm. And when we have transparency, yeah. uh, maybe so start seeing uh, things qu quicker. So you're a CEO of and co-founder of Equally, an uh, organization that leverages the power of investments, knowledge, and donations to accelerate gender equality in the workplace. So can you explain a bit how this leveraging works? Right. So gender equality in the economy is not only the right thing to do, but actually it's very interesting that there's a business case behind it. Uh, a lot of studies show that when there's more gender balance, the companies are better, they get um, better financial returns. 
So given this and the fact that things are not moving very quickly when it comes to gender equality, we decided to co-found Equileap and to give investors an opportunity to invest in gender equality. What we do is we score the largest companies around the world, all the publicly listed companies, on how they're doing on gender equality, and we rank them. And then with this ranking, we, we co-create investment products with the highest scoring companies so that the investors can invest in those companies that are doing better. What is the highest scoring company at the moment? At the moment, it's very interesting. Well, I think some of you have the report, so ma maybe you've already seen it, but it was quite, uh, in 2018 was our last re uh, report. And we were quite surprised because it's a company that comes from a traditionally male uh, sector, but it's General Motors. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It's a car making company. Interesting. So that again tells us that if a car making company can get the highest score in gender equality, then everybody else should also yeah. do that. The one who follows is L'Oreal, which is a makeup company. Okay. I think many people kind of expect that. But the interesting thing is neither one of these two companies, even though they're the highest scoring, get a grade higher than 71%. So they still have a lot to go. Yeah. So Kara, you yeah. are a chief marketing operations officer at Microsoft. So how diverse is the tech industry in your opinion? Uh, it's not my opinion, but it's a fact it that the fact. tech <laughs> industry is not very diverse yeah. uh, from that perspective. And in fact, I think so GM is led by a woman, um, which I think really helps to drive the, uh, the equality there. Um, tech industry is not diverse and uh, we know that the, the data here in the Netherlands in particular uh, tells us that only 18% of the tech industry represented in the Netherlands is represented by women. Uh, that is extremely low. And I think that um, dates back to decisions that are made at a very early age in someone's life um, that suggests what direction they're going to go. So, and I'll link this a little bit to creativity. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the creative gene um, is the same in boys and girls um, in, in their early years. And at about, about the age of 14 here in the Netherlands, we have a, a choice in the system which says um, you can choose to go towards uh, maths and sciences or you can go more towards arts and humanities to simplify that, yep. uh, that path. And what's happening at that age is while boys and girls uh, both um, will score the same on all these tests, boys are stimulated to make the choice for the maths and the scientists because they think that's the thing that boys, and boys should do. Whereas girls are stimulated um, by their teachers, by their parents, and by um, the role models that they see mm -hmm. to choose more for an arts and humanities path. And yeah. so already at the age of 14, we're deciding to opt out of technology, yeah. to opt out of math, science, and engineering. Yeah. So the STEM courses. And that's already the, the start of the problem. So the funnel is already not very big. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's happening though is that if you can imagine from a technology lens, every company will become a software company. Yeah. And that's also a fact. Uh, we're moving in this direction where uh, digital transformation is changing the way that the world operates. And um, because of that, um, jobs are appearing in many categories that hadn't appeared before, which are attracting individuals um, for technology. You know, so you can say, uh, I want to go and work in uh, the retail industry, but in fact, they need someone to design their website. You know, or they need someone who will help them through uh, uh, data science and uh, analytics in order to understand mm. the patterns and uh, purchasing behaviors of their customers. So um, we're finding that um, the pure technology lens is becoming also very diversified mm -hmm. in terms of where the, the needs are yeah. um, becoming very cross-industrial. Yeah. Um, so Karin, you've studied women's studies at Harvard University. Has this um, study uh, change your perspective on how you uh, look at the position of women in society? Well, I think what was interesting is that it was very much about nature and nurture discussion. And the, the, during the two years that I was there, the president of Harvard University, Larry Summers, you may recall this, but... He's been here. <laughs> well, he's probably been here, but he also <laughs> made a... He actually made a remark behind closed doors in the faculty room saying that women's brains were less wired to study science. And it, it was the reason for him that he had to leave. Fired. And I remember having two times I had a meeting with him because when I was studying women's studies, the person who had funded the graduate's uh, chair, she had withdrawn her money, which meant that all the students who were studying women's studies could not complete their studies with a graduate level, which is why I had to change her to Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School studying social sciences. 
What really struck me during the first year is that it was very anti-man, and I was like, that's not what I came to study here for, because I always think men and women have unique qualities and leadership qualities. Mm -hmm. So take advantage of the difference, and then I think that sky's the limit. Yeah. And I think this nature-nurture discussion is also something that we should look at here in the Netherlands, because um, I actually also co-organize TEDx Amsterdam Women, yeah. and I bring in all the partnerships with all the companies. Well, one of them is Microsoft. And um, we had our Minister of Emancipation. I mean, a lot of people don't even know that her official title is Minister of OCMA and Emancipation, but it's never really mentioned in her yeah. official title. She had her the, the last TED Talk, and she was talking about how advertising really influences young girls and young boys already at the age of five. So she was a result of that herself. And I think if, I mean, apparently they had done research that parents mostly Google how can I find out about the talents of my son? But they don't Google, how can I find out about the talents of my daughter? Yeah. So I think even if we go back to age five, I think the government can really play a big role. Yeah, yeah we will talk about solutions uh, throughout this interview. Um, I, in the next section, I have a, a few statements. And you can all say if you agree or disagree with the statements. And the first statement is about edu uh, educational choices. You already touched upon it. Uh, so the statement goes, the government together with universities should acti actively strive for an equal distribution, distribution sorry, of male and female students in each program. Would you agree or disagree? Yes. And yeah. It's about yes. striving, so not about uh, having a percentage. You agree? I think so, yes, I, I do agree. If we believe that talent is equally spread among men and women, and that you will have good men and bad men and good women and bad women and women who can do STEM and those who can't, if we really believe that it's equally distributed, then it just makes sense to try to strive for 50-50. Yeah. Because if we don't, you're losing out on talent. The moment that you have a young girl who would be um, um, prone to be good at STEM, but doesn't because she feels that's not what girls do or whatever, you're losing out on that talent. Yeah. So I think that in the end, we should try to strive for a 50-50 and also for the same sort of um, percentages of the type of ethnic diversity we have in a society. So when it comes, that's how we will get the most talented people coming into the certain type of jobs. So would you say that if we get rid of this idea that girls should go, for example, to nursing school, just right. to generalize it, if you get rid of this idea, then more uh, girls will enter entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurial studies or engineering, And more for boys who maybe would be excellent nurses mm. yeah. won't feel that that's not a boy's uh, so career. So you don't think that this is an uh, inherent personal difference between no. male and females? No, I don't think so. I no? think that we are all wired differently and we all have different qualifications, but I think that, you know, it's equally spread as far as the good and the bad qualities among men and women and all kinds of diversities and, and ethnicity. And so if you have a really, truly equal place field, you will have the same type of percentages coming into the different types of jobs. Kara, yeah. you agree? Yeah, I, I, I firmly agree. And I would say, and from a recruitment perspective, from a, from a corporate perspective, mm -hmm. it's the same for universities, governments, wherever you are. That, you know, so if I start with a candidate pool where nine out of the ten candidates are men, and there's one female, do you think that female really has a 50-50 chance of, of a obtaining the role. No, they don't. So you need to have, and in fact, we insist that in every candidate pool, there's a 50-50 balance of candidates in order to make that a fair and equitable process. Yeah. If you don't start already equitably, you won't end up with an equitable decision. Yeah. Karine, do you agree on this point? Or yeah, I actually totally agree. And I'm actually thinking back of the class of our son in Amsterdam. I remember because we came back from the States in 2006. And there were seven boys and there were 24 girls in that class. And then they only had female teachers. And thank God, at one point, there was a male teacher that came into school. And that man transformed both for the girls and the boys their yeah. lower school education. Yeah. So I want to continue to the following statement, which is uh, about the glass ceiling. So the statement goes, Dutch women experience a glass ceiling. <laughs> yeah. Deanna, you're laughing. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, and would, you, would you agree? Yes, I think yeah, okay. yes, I would agree. I think that now here again, there's an enormous amount of research that says that 
we feel an, a direct bond with someone who looks like us, who feels, who has the same experiences. Um, and many, many of you might have had that feeling when you travel abroad and you find the one person who also studied in Amsterdam, you immediately feel a bond with that person. And so what happens is if the leadership is all um, white males of a certain age with a certain background who went to a certain university who had a certain ba you know experiences and then when they're interviewing and a young man comes with exactly the same experiences there is an, a natural feeling of oh yes this person is probably going to make it you mm -hmm. know I've, i you know you also hear that many times uh young men in recruiting uh positions um a woman will be recruited because she has a track record and a man will be recruited because he has potential. And this is, these are the kind of things that we face yeah. when there is, uh, you know, um, sort of an unbiased, uh, uh, unconscious bias. Yeah. But then again, I think if we know that there's this bias, it's no longer unconscious. So we can't talk about it anymore, yeah. you know? So I think that this is where we have to start putting some things in place to ensure that everybody has the same opportunity. So you would say our society, especially in the Netherlands, is alwa already aware of a glass ceiling, but yes. now it's the time to... To make some differences. Yeah. I mean, we know, we've also known, if, I don't know if you followed the stories on the... Um, the in Utrecht, uh, in the municipality, they knew that this was happening, that just a certain type of people with a certain type of last name, m men were being recruited, so they started doing blind recruitments where yeah. the CV was being sent without a last name, without the first name, and they were seeing that the people going on to the next the recruitment uh, uh, phases were yeah. much more balanced. And so I do think that we have to, do, we have to take some measures to understand yeah. that there is unconscious bias and that you have to give examples. And going back to what you said, if you end up with the glass ceiling and you end up then with 10 men and one woman, and that one woman turned out not to be so great and she fails, then everybody turns around and says, you see what happens when you put a woman in a position of, uh, of management? Yeah. So this is why we have to ensure that we try to break that. And the thing is as well, so that, that one woman yeah. has to outperform 10 other men. Right. Yeah. You know, so she has to demonstrate that she's better than 10 others uh, in order to win the job. And, you know, and so that's already not setting right. you up for yeah. uh, the right success. And you know, it's a funny thing, this, this, this glass ceiling. Um, personally, I don't feel that this has been something that I've always thought, oh, there's this glass ceiling up there, and how am I ever going to break through? Yeah. I personally have always looked at every new opportunity as taking the next step forward. And so I have tried to progress myself and I've done everything I could to make that happen. And Can you maybe and name an example of a s certain situation in which you experienced this glass ceiling in your career? No, I so as I say, I don't, I don't feel that I've ever thought about there being a glass ceiling because that, that to so me you don't just have any experience of uh, that you felt you were treated differently because you're a woman. I think I'm treated differently every day because I'm a woman, um, but that's not because of a glass ceiling. I think that at a certain point in many people's careers, we all will experience a plateau or a point in time where you say, can I go further? Can I take another step forward? Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily agree that it's because you're a woman or a man that you can't take that next step forward because you're limited by this glass ceiling. Yeah. I think that uh, I, I look at it differently. So I, I feel that it's on all of us to um, look for new opportunities to progress, to be on a frontier, to be curious and to find out what's next for yeah. ourselves in our own progress. And by defining that through this lens of a glass ceiling um, already suggests a limitation for anyone. Mm -hmm. and, and so I don't think that's for me something that has guided my life of, oh boy, I better break through that glass ceiling one day. Yeah. I'm not sure where that is, if I'm standing on top of it right now or if I'm still looking up at it. Yeah. I'm not sure where it is in yeah. my own career For example, one, one problem that I notice uh, for women is uh, the concept of uh, maternal duties. So that there is a certain prejudice that women want to become pregnant and that's why they don't get a promotion, for example. How can we, we solve these prejudices? What, what is the solution to this? I actually wanted to comment on the glass ceiling because yeah, of I don't think it's there. No? Well, it's a very personal thing. I didn't r really experience it, but then I chose when I was age 34 to go my own way and step out of the corporate world because it wasn't going fast enough. 
my, and my mind was too quick and I often saw things and nobody was doing anything about it. And I mm. thought, okay, I can do this much better when I walk alone. But then, of course, you need to join forces again. I think what we really should focus on the Netherlands is to create new role models because, I mean, there were a couple of panels this week that I was on or I was attending, and it's still often the same women, and some of them were in their 70s. And with all due respect, they've, they were often the only one in the room, but I'm now in my early 50s, and I think that it's my age group now that it's time for us to be more visible. Okay. And I think it's our duty to, uh, to actually be mentors for younger women as well, yeah. mm -hmm. um, because we want to be the role models you know, for them, because we've actually dealt with other things. I think what's also still in the Netherlands is that, that there are still floors that have sticky, you know, so that, you know, so I mean, I think it's often very much in the women themselves. Uh, what do you think on, on this point of maternal duties? Well, I think, first of all, the Netherlands should stop being so negative about part-time work. Because I think women who, who choose to work part-time because they want to still stay in the workforce but also want to do a good job with raising their children mm -hmm. or being connected or maybe not end up being divorced because they never saw, you know, um, and I think, Not yet, but no, but <laughs> I've, I've seen a lot of women my age work part-time for like maybe 10 years, three days a week, sometimes four times, and now they've gone back into working full-time. And they're now actually at the boardroom table, because I always say, if you're on the menu and not at the table, you have actually, other people will, uh, will really decide for you. Yeah. So, uh, and with the maternity leave, there's some person who really says that beautiful, it's the CEO of Adyen, he says, women having children is a natural course of life and our company should actually accommodate that and i've never heard any ceo say it that clearly as he did yeah yeah, 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 yeah. when it yeah go ahead so go ahead Diane. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to parental leave uh, for both fathers and mothers i think what's going to help is to give equal equal amount of time to men and women to take care of their children yeah yes i think that that's the solution when you say you know and you can talk about maternity leave or paternity leave uh, or primary caregivers, secondary caregivers, you know, um, it's important for both genders to have an opportunity to spend time with their children when they're born, when they're adopted, when they're brought into the family. It shouldn't be just for women. And I think that the moment that the companies say we give parental leave to both fathers and mothers of the same amount of time, it's actually good for the families, for the children. Um, it's good for the fathers. And then no longer you have this feeling of, well, I'm not going to hire a woman between 32 and 40 because she might take off on parental leave. Yeah. You know, but then anybody who is between 30s and 40s, I mean, actually, it will be then interesting because for women, they will be at risk at a certain amount of time. Then for men with their second families or third families, <laughs> they'll be at risk the whole time that you'll <laughs> have to give them parental leave. But That's when we'll have really quality. But negatively equality. affects men. Right, then, but then we'll That's be like, well, we well want, let's right? try to hire women. No, but... Um, <laughs> It's, of course, just, you know, to say that things can change. Yeah. But I think that here again, we're talking about gender equality and it should be offered to both genders. Mm. Yeah. And then it shouldn't be left on, it, it's a woman, it's a mother, and therefore she needs to take care of the children. You know, it should be then, I think we'll create better families and yeah. also better workforces. And then we can talk about being part-time workers or flexible workers, not only for women, but also for men. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just want to, so complementing what Diana yeah, has just said, and I was going to offer the uh, example from Microsoft, in fact, so how we're approaching this in the Netherlands, and, mm -hmm. that, and that is indeed by looking at that equal opportunity and distribution of, of taking care of, of new children in your life. And so what we have done in the Netherlands is we've uh, significantly extended the amount of time that a man may have off after the birth of their new child. Um, so parental leave is six weeks uh, for a man. Mm -hmm. um, for a woman, it's now six months. And so we're also saying um, it's okay to take it's six months away yeah. to be with your newborn baby and there, your job is there when you come back. Um, and so there's, for that perspective, there's no issue. Yeah. Uh, and the number of people I have in my organization to the sort of uh, different time worked uh, individual, 80%, so 80% would equate to four days in the week. Um, and when the both mother and father does an 80% contract, let's say, they're already able to fill in uh, most of the week for themselves so you on would say that how they take care of their family. Sorry, you would say that it's also responsibility of firms themselves to get rid of this prejudice when hiring people. For who? I'm for sorry? the responsibility of firms uh, to get rid of this prejudice. Uh, yes, I think when so. When I they think hire new Yes, people. I think that companies have a role to play yeah. um, in how they're looking at setting up their system for 
uh, recognizing the, um, yeah, and I wouldn't like to use the word work-life balance, although I think that's something we all talk about a lot, it's work-life harmony. Mm -hmm. So how you like really that. look at integrating your work and your life uh, in a way that is uh, creating harmony. And but uh, you could say from a business perspective, uh, you want to have the m most efficient workers and if, uh, if you hire a woman that wants to get pregnant and who's off for six months at Microsoft is less efficient than uh, when you hire a man. But this is where you want to have the best quality people yeah. 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 and you want to create an environment where you can get the best out of them. Yeah. Mm. And I think that you know nobody works harder than uh, a woman who's just had a child and comes back to work and needs to prove herself. Mm. If you've had, if you've gone out there and she's getting an, oppor an equal opportunity to do that, yeah. that will be one hardworking employee that you will have. So I think that if you offer the leave to both men and, and women, mm -hmm. and you tell them when you come back, if you do your job well, and we will create an environment that works for that, then then why not? I mean, it's also, we're no longer in the time of factories where people had to come in at nine in the morning and leave at five. Everybody, my, my office travels with me and my phone. Mm -hmm. You know, I can do my work here, or I can do it tomorrow wherever I am. So I think that that's the matter of trying to get the, create a culture within a company where people feel happy to work there, where mm -hmm. they will give their best, and where you will Which recompense Which improves that. the quality of their employees. Right. Yeah, okay. Okay, right. I want to move to the next statement. Uh, it's about investments. So the statement goes, women experience mo more difficulty attracting investment funds. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, they do. Well, I mean, I don't know if you are referring to the research that Janneke Nisa did with yeah. David Moyer. Yeah, yeah probably. So well. the, this research said that um, according to this research, only 1.6% yeah. of the startups in the Netherlands led by women receive investment from these funds. And this is not due to the lack of women-led startups. No, I mean, well, it's actually due to lack of females in the financial sector, because yeah. women tend to give money to women, <laughs> and men, men to tend men. to give money to men. And it's actually even for women of diverse backgrounds, so ethnic, it's mm -hmm. even more difficult. I but mean why is it that men only invest in men? Well, not only, but according to these statistics, men invest in men. Why that's, is that? That's their unconscious bias, you know, thinking, oh, well, you know, she's just doing... I was an entrepreneur myself for six years, and I never saw a woman in the room and I had a really hard time getting my money. Whereas I had all my, you know, the business plan, I was great, I had a great mm -hmm. advisory board and everything. There were always nine uh, business plans of nine male entrepreneurs, and then I was the only female, and often it was very difficult. I mean, I, I got my money, but it was much more difficult than for most men. Yeah, have you any experience with this, or? Well, this is again the case of, he reminds me of myself, so let's give him an opportunity, right? Yeah. So I think that you say it correctly, when you have, more venture capitalists who are women, that that, that will balance out also. Um, when um, people look at this from a different way, I mean, our organization, Equilib, when mm. I started it, we don't get um, investment capital, but we get philanthropic capital. And so it's philanthropists who support our work. And I have to also say that most of the philanthropists who are supporting our work are women. Yeah. So here again, it could be that I'm reaching out to people who say, I believe in this, I kind of feel that this is the right way to put our money. So this is again a field in which we should strive for that equality uh, between men and women because then you just also resolve Right, because the what you want, these are people who are investing, venture capitalists are investing, and many times yeah. they're self-made, right? And there was an article not so long ago that the best opportunity for a woman to become rich is to marry rich, <laughs> right? Like that's the best chances it's quite you have old out fashions. there. As long as that's <laughs> still that way, you yeah. know, we, we you want women to become rich also from their own uh, endeavor. Yeah. And that's when things need to yeah. balance. I quickly want to move to the audience to see if there are any questions uh, regarding these topics or regarding their careers. See you run over there, yeah. Can I hold it? <laughs> Can I hold it, please? Hold it. No. No, but it's going to be more. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you very much for coming here and uh, giving us this talk. Uh, I think it's very important to talk about the problems that women face uh, in organization as well. Now, I have a question. Uh, all of you agree that we need to strive for gender equality. Now, when I think about uh, AIM, I know that uh, usually you have like a number or like a goal you want to achieve. So could you tell me what is the end goal of gender equality? Thank you. That we don't yeah. have to celebrate International Women's <laughs> Day or Women's <laughs> Week. <laughs> For me. Yeah. 
when we, when we score companies and we look at the gender balance um, of the companies from their boards to their senior managers to their workforces, we give the highest number for a 40-60% balance. This means between anything between 40 and 60%. And this means that if either one of those genders is higher than 60%, they would get less points than if they're there. And why is and it I not 50-50? Um, I think it's very difficult to get to an exact 50-50, so we decided to get the, f the highest at 40-60. Uh, once we've been able to reach that, we can uh, raise the ladder a little bit yeah. more. Yeah. I would say for me, very simply, equity is 50-50. Yeah. Um, but, but I would want to come back to the way you positioned the question, in fact, which was, you know, this problem women are facing. Actually, I don't <laughs> think this is a problem women are facing. Neither. I think it's a problem we all face. And women are not the problem. Um, I think that <laughs> we're all part of solving for the solution. Uh, and uh, it takes all of us, and in fact, when you know, we talk about uh, International Women's Day, I'd love to see this room filled with men. Yeah. This is not a topic only for women. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I did want to take a moment to comment on yeah. that as well. There Thank are you. a lot of men, I'm really yeah. pleased. Yeah, yes, yeah, I'm there I'm are. I, I've yeah. noticed that yeah. the younger the group yeah. is that we speak to, the more, more gender men. balance yeah. in, the, in, the, in the audience. Yeah, so I want to move to the next uh, statement. It's about gender, uh, the gender pay gap. The gender pay gap is the result of unequal treatment by employers. Would you agree or disagree? Well, well not necessarily. Mm. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, I, think I think that also uh, society plays a big role in that, the government. I mean, if you look, for example, in America, most women have to work there because you know, education is very expensive, healthcare is very expensive, I mean, cost of living is much more expensive. Mm. Here in the Netherlands, I mean, you could really get by for a long time on one salary. And uh, I always notice that when women actually get divorced, that's when they realize, oh my God, I was actually living in this illusionary luxury world, and now I have to start earning my own money. And then they realize that the, f that the workforce isn't really, you know, waiting for them anymore because they don't have the skills. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what should happen here is that because I still hear that women often get asked what they were earning with their last salary. They're actually not allowed to ask you that question. Well, I don't think they ask men that. So those are, I mean, I think that the government can play a big and role. And to what extent do you think it's uh, a woman's own responsibility? Because there are some numbers of well, one third of the women in a UK study said that they never actually asked for a pay rise, for example. So do you think this is also part of the own responsibility of Absolutely. women? Yeah. I mean, I think that we should educate young women. I mean, I always found it very hard to talk about money. I mean, mm -hmm. money was not a thing that we spoke about at home. So that's something I really had to learn myself. Mm -hmm. And I remember that as I w when I worked as a, as a business coach for a while, that was really something that I focused on with a lot of my clients. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, you know, saying, I'm actually worth 80,000 euros. And they were like, oh, no, I'm not. I'm like, yes, you are. Yeah. So. We have, yeah. yeah. We have. Gera, do you agree on this? Yeah. So, uh, and I completely agree with what Karina is saying. And I, and I think something else is important. Is um, I heard a comment on the radio this morning that said, "Well, uh, because we're talking about International Women's Day today, and this this conversation came up on the station, and the DJ said something to the effect of, well, that's because women don't know how to negotiate.' And I thought, okay, there you go. Let me call yeah. the station. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, it's the. This is not a fact. Mm -hmm. um, so both men and women have equal skilling in negotiation. Um, however, um, <coughs> this is a skill that can be learned. And I think to Karine's point that if you're not talking about this, if you're not learning about this, um, then you're not going to be a better negotiator. But it is not the fact. Um, so if you give men and women equal skilling on negotiation mm -hmm. and you put them into a, a boardroom and you let them negotiate, um, the majority of the time, the woman is going to look for the win-win in that situation, whereas the result or the outcome of the man negotiating is that he's going to negotiate for his own position. And, and that's a, a, a fact. And so what we're looking for is how can we help women to also think about how can I get the best outcome for myself mm -hmm. when I'm negotiating for my own salary, yeah. um, because they have every right to do so. And uh, I think there are some traits that um, women will um, uh, be putting forward more often than men, which uh, may not always work out in their favor when they're negotiating, and particularly for a salary. So for instance, if a woman is presented with the facts that say, 
in this team, we need to balance the, the total cost, and therefore um, we're going to be looking for a, a distribution. She will often uh, tend to say, and this is a generalization, but tend to say, um, well, okay, then let's, um, uh, I'll, I'll take a little bit less so that others can have a little bit more, because I wouldn't want to give myself more than others, so I want this to be equitable. Um, this is one thing, and so the woman will not put herself forward. And also, if she feels that there's any uh, sense of an unequal uh, uh, treatment, mm -hmm. um, she will not want to put herself forward. So I think it's important to understand also how compassion. the woman is negotiating, yeah, that, um, uh, oh, that that skill can be taught to, mm -hmm. to come out with a better outcome, particularly yeah. when it comes to your own salary. And have you uh, noticed, have you yourself any experience with uh, negotiating on your uh, on your salary and finding any difficulties in that, or? No, no? I'm very happy with my salary. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm good, I'm glad. Um, so the next statement is about management and leadership. We already talked about it before, but uh, a famous woman who has sat on these couches from the IMF, Christine Lagarde, said, if it had been Lehman sisters rather than Lehman brothers, the rules might well look a lot different today. And of course she's referring to uh, the, f the behavioral, l the leadership position of women, uh, in for in this case in the financial sector, that she probably implies that women uh, are risk averse, uh, and maybe uh, yeah. How do you, how do you look at that? Well, there was this article this morning exactly talking about this. Is that women are ver apparently very good at. Sh you know, at dealing with money on short-term basis, so that's why they were good at that house out book here. Mm -hmm. um, but and apparently, well, you actually had a nice comment on that. So, but apparently, women are less good in the long-term vision with money. Mm -hmm. But I don't even think that 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 they should say that because I think we probably are. We just haven't been allowed to be part of that space. <laughs> and um, uh, I mean, but and yeah, and I truly think that women don't want to gamble in that sense. Yeah. Do you want to comment on this? I mean, w when she said that, of course it was funny and it made me laugh and I thought that it's good to have these types of comments. Yeah. But I think that a group of sisters where everybody's the same is just as bad as a group of brothers where everybody's the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the end, it's about diversity and about gender balance. And a group where you have the diverse qualities coming in, that one is risk averse, the other one is willing to take chances, the one is going to look at the budget, mm -hmm. the other one is an overviewer. That type of team will be the best team. Yeah. And so that's what we want to go. You don't want to go into a team of, uh, or a world where we say, it's been run by men, it's been a disaster, let's now try to run by women. I think what we're trying to say is, let's have a gender balance and have gender diversity, um, all types of diversity together, and that's when you have the really good teams come up. Yeah, Kara, do you also notice yeah. this uh, during your career? If that that uh, balance in gender uh, results into the best outcome in a company? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to take it one step further and say that. So the the foundation of the the diversity and the opportunity to to have equality is is that's that's what lays the foundation, right? Mm -hmm. But even more importantly to me is the inclusion. So we talk about diversity and inclusion, uh, D&I, um, but we tend to forget about the inclusion part. And so you can make all these efforts to ensure that you have an equal distribution in your workforce, um, but if, let's say in the case of the woman, she lands in the workforce and is not feeling included in that workforce um, because of her, the diversity she brings, we're still not making progress. And uh, there's a, a beautiful quote um, that I really love, which is, um, I will go where I am invited, and I will stay where I'm welcome. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I think this, for me, kind of summarizes the, um, the definition of inclusion. Yeah. Um, because it's not about a woman uh, entering into a man's world and then needing to look like the man, sound like the man, talk like the man. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I remember back early in, early in my career, one um, short, sort of now funny story, but it was confusing for me at the time, was you know, sitting in one of my first uh, boardroom conversations, and I was the only woman at the table with a group of men, and I noticed all these behaviors going on around me. You know, so the, the, the president started the, the, uh, the opening of the conversation, and 
you know, the, the man next to me was kind of going, <coughs> and then the guy over here was going, <coughs> you know, and, and I was like, what's, what's going, what's wrong with these people, you know? <laughs> and, um, and, and I was thinking, what's, and then what I noticed was the first thing that happened was that the person sitting here spoke first, and then this person over here spoke next. And it occurred to me later that, you know, we came from sort of these, um, uh, uh, caveman days where grunting was the sign of, you know, communication <laughs> and that, you know, there's a way to warm up your voice and get yourself to be identified in the room as, as existing, as belonging, um, because you've kind of said, <coughs> I'm over here, you know, look at me. Yeah. And so the focus will go towards where that noise is happening in the room. But you didn't uh, take over that behavior. No, I <laughs> just was kind of s stunned in silence and I thought like, what's, what's wrong with all these people that have a problem <laughs> with their throat? But I, but I learned um, a certain behaviors and it was a very male behavior at the time that I was observing and I mm -hmm. thought, okay, so if I need to start grunting in meetings, you know, to get myself known or, you know, identify that I really want to say mm -hmm. something something next. I'll do that and uh, you know and it's not the sort of politely putting up your your hand and saying okay I want to go next yeah. but it's really knowing how to put yourself into that conversation and so learning some of those behaviors was also important and yeah. and those are there are many things that I have learned from fantastic male colleagues that I have had throughout my career that have taught me a lot and um, you know and those those types of things I think are important but also recognizing your your role in the uh, inclusivity of of the environment that you're in and and how important that is. Yeah, so I want to focus on uh, the finding solutions as well in the next part. And um, yeah, you've already touched about it about female strength and how we should uh, portray ourselves basically. So the statement goes: women should behave more like men if they want to compete for the same jobs. You know, it really <laughs> used to be Do you that agree way. Or disagree? Yeah. Um, I disagree, okay. but I realize that many companies have that culture where women end up doing this. So we have to change that culture. Uh, when I graduated from college, I remember one of my best friends, she uh, was ready to go into corporate USA, it was then, and she wanted the job. She got the job at Procter & Gamble, and she said, I've got my diploma, I have my background, now all I need is to learn how to golf and learn how to drink. <laughs> and then I'll make it within this company. And you know, there's enough women who know that, that think, okay, I have to change <laughs> yeah. in order to make it there. And I think that that's how the game has been played uh, until now for very long, but I think that that's what we're saying here at this table, that we want to change that. So it's not about improving the woman, changing the woman, making sure she fits. It's really about changing the culture so that you can get the greatest talents out there to thrive and be, feel included <coughs> and thrive within your company. Yeah. So, when you say that, I don't want to agree with it because I wish that we could now start a world where we don't have to start acting like a certain type of male in mm -hmm. order to make it into a company. And this is something that everybody needs to be aware of. But do you think that at this point women should maybe behave more like men in that sense to make a change now because no, it's I going think so no. slow? No, no, I think that a lot of women had to do not. that in the 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. and they're there, and now you have to you really have to stop doing this. Yeah. Because otherwise we end up with all these women who act and look like men and are playing golf and well drinking. And, and, and the problem is, disagree. Well, I think it's because these women uh, betray their own sex when they have that behavior. And I still well see... Well, they're trying to make it, right? I know. So, yeah. But that's where we have to change. No, but I mean, I know a couple of women our age who have done it this way. Mm -hmm. And then when I run into them, and they think that they're really, you know, somebody because they're on that board of that company. And then I look at her and I think, you are not representing me. You may be representing yourself and you think you're one of the guys, but you are a woman, you were are, you are born a woman, you've got a daughter, you've got friends, and you're actually betraying us. And what, I, what I'm really upset about, every time when a woman falls, like, you know, like at ABN AMRO, you know, what happened last year, it's bad for all of us. Because, you know, I mean, I was championing her and she was making a lot of wonderful changes within ABN AMRO. I mean, I saw that because it's also one of our partners. And then we are back to where we were. And then, no, so I totally agree with Diana. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Kara? I think if I had tried to shape myself or mold myself into the male characteristics, I would have failed miserably and I wouldn't be where I am today. I'm here today because of the characteristics that I bring Mm -hmm. and because of my capabilities, my potential, um, and what I have learned along the way. And I think that those are traits. So being a learn-it-all, not a know-it-all, 
in environments, so being someone who has curiosity, someone who is happy to put themselves in someone else's shoes and see it from their perspective and understand, okay, I understand what you're going through, so how can we solve for that together? And I think because of these traits that I possess, I've made it to where I am so far, and I'm not done yet, I'm on a journey. Yeah. Um, and if I had tried to force myself into trying to behave or take on someone else's skill sets or characteristics, mm -hmm. I would have failed miserably and I would not be where I am today. So a UK study shows that currently uh, women are underrepresented in top positions in more than 80% of the companies. So what would you say that uh, would be a possible solution to change this? How can we get more women into top positions? Is this in the UK or is this globally? In, uh, in the UK, there was a UK study, so more than 8% companies in the UK, uh, uh, they're in those top positions, women are underrepresented. I'm not surprised. I live partly in London and I see it. London is, is very, I mean, England is very old fashioned yeah. still. Yeah. It's similar to the number yeah. here where yeah. we yeah. saw 27% of women in management positions. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think we can change this? So I think we cannot change things that we cannot measure. So the most important thing is transparency. Uh, companies need to be transparent about their percentages of men and women at all their levels, from the board to the executives to the workforce. And once we have that transparency on the numbers, on gender balance, and going back to your point on the pay gap, transparency mm -hmm. on pay, that's the first step so that we can then say, okay, this is what needs to change. Yep. So I think forcing or encouraging companies to put targets and to be transparent that's what we try to do with the rankings that we create with Equilib, with the indices, by saying this is an example of a company who has reached gender balance, this is what's happening, investors trying mm. to find those companies. The first step is transparency. Yeah. And then the second step, you can call it whatever you want, quotas or, or targets, but I mean, uh, trying to reach that level. Yeah, do you think quotas are the, well, are I the think solution? Uh, I don't like quotas, I love targets. I think that that's how we should just talk about mm -hmm. it because when people talk about quotas, everybody tries to close the door and say, let's not talk about that. Yeah. So I don't mention quotas anymore. Yeah, well but I, I mean, think I can mention if, targets if, if you get into a management uh, team uh, through a quota, then every decision you make, you will always be that woman that um, maybe, maybe you're uh, qualified for the job but still you're the woman sitting there because of a quota. Do, don't you think that will harm like decision-making uh, procedures of, of women or the credibility or Well, I think sense? that people, I think that women should step over that. I remember Nelly smith Cruz. I remember she walked around yeah, Brussels and she, she said, said, you know, I'm happy to be quoted. Uh, mm -hmm. This past Sunday, we had the uh, pre-screening pre of the movie On the Basis of Sex about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And she was one out of nine women, you know, who, who has uh, allowed to study at Harvard Business School or Harvard Law School. And then she was invited into the home of the, of the dean, and then w there was a male professor escorting the women into the uh, dining room table, and then all women should, or had to uh, stand up and actually explain why they thought that it was their right to actually take a place at Harvard Law School, which actually should have gone to a man. But she never said, oh my God, I was one out of nine. I mean, she took that opportunity. So I think, you know, I mean, I, I never liked quotas, but I now believe in it because, you know, sometimes you just need a measurement, but yeah. it is temporary. And then, you know, w once we've reached parity, I think we can let it go again. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of quotas, so I believe in equity. And, uh, you know, I think that it's a, uh, um, so, we're, so some conversations we're having right now are, uh, so if you think about a quota, you must fill this by uh, uh, a woman. Now we're starting to have a conversation about anti-discrimination. So, you know, men who are saying, well, wait a minute, then there was a woman, but uh, I could have taken that job. So now I feel discriminated against. You know, so I, I, th I think you don't win on that, that uh, conversation. I think it's important to say, we're looking for the best person for this job. And we're looking for um, the following qualifications. And we're going to, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to create a, a pool of candidates which is equal to yeah. begin with. And from that basis, then we can make a fair and equitable decision um, because we already started on a 50-50 uh, starting yeah. point. The problem is if the playing field is not leveled and there's always going to be difficulty getting there, then you end up with a situation where you have more of one gender than the other. Mm. So what measures do we need in order to advance this? Now I keep on thinking of the studies that we now see from the World Economic Forum 
telling us that at the rate things are changing right now, it's going to take over 200 years before there's gender parity in the economy. That's too long. Yeah. That's more than seven generations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Are we willing to wait that, or could we just say, things are not changing quickly, put the target, put the quota, let's move on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I think that we need to start doing something so that we don't have to say another seven generations before yeah. the pay gap is closed, the, the leadership gap is co closed, and the participation gap. Yeah. And the, the World Bank just published a report yeah. last week that there are only six countries globally who have, you know, equal rights on all these different yeah. levels. On they're the Netherlands all is not in there. They're all from Europe, but the Netherlands is not yeah. in there. The pace is way too slow. Um, so I, uh, myself, I was, I was born in the United States. I grew up in Australia. I spent seven years there. And uh, uh, coming to Europe, I, I arrived 25 years ago. I lived in Germany, France, and the Netherlands. And always having thought about the Netherlands, I've been here now for 16 years, and always have thought about the Netherlands as being a very progressive country. Um, and and yet when I came, at the time I was working with Hewlett Packard, and I remember the number because it was in my head, we had 18% women in the Netherlands in management positions. And now just this report that came out yesterday says we're at 27%. I'm thinking, yeah. boy, so in 16 years. So that was 25 years ago? Uh, that was uh, uh, 25, no, 16 the years ago. 16, I 16 years ago, it was yeah. 80%. 18%, and now it's, and now it's 27%. Yeah. Uh, and so that's very slow. It's not even yeah. a 10% uh, increase. And so that's moving way too slow. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not okay to take no. uh, another 200 years before we would reach some kind yeah. of equity. And it's good for yeah. us. We have all these studies showing that there will yeah. be financial prosperity through gender equality in yeah. the workforce. And so I think that we need to remember that and keep our eye on that ball. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm just yeah. thinking about, you said about um, bla having blank vacancies, so without uh, the name and, and without yeah. age. Yep. But what if uh, in the next, uh, if, you, if you have a vacancy at Microsoft and you, uh, uh, you use this uh, procedure, and what if uh, you notice for a few vacancies then your pool of candidates is, there's no equal balance? Is that necessary then a wrong thing? So we don't accept any application pool without an equal balance. Okay. So the, and, and what happens then is we may have to extend the time so if we post a job uh, on, the, on, the, on the site, then we say, okay, this, uh, this job posting will be alive for the next two months while we gather our candidates for the pool. And mm -hmm. if at that point in time, at two months, we say, uh, well, we don't have an equal balance in terms of the number of candidates, then we extend the time of posting. Yeah. We extend our recruitment and we say, okay, we're going to need to look further uh, in order to ensure that we have a, um, a, a starting point which is equal. Okay. We will not allow any manager to s begin the process of recruitment uh, and interviewing until we have an equal pool. We won't do it. But you don't use the blank uh, applicants sheets? No, we don't, no. Do you think no. that's uh, something for uh, the next coming years? That this is a nice uh, way for firms to get rid of uh, prejudices about women, about... So I don't, so I think you either you decide you're going to go for 50-50 and make sure it is representative yeah. or you say we're just going to anonymize but then the anonymized side of that also needs to be sure that it is equally representative. Yeah. So I don't know if you're winning uh, by just simply not displaying the name or the, yeah. the photo or anything else. I think, you know, that conversation for me could extend into other areas in terms of um, not just gender, but race and accessibility, persons with impairment or disabilities. You know, so I think, you know, that that conversation for me goes beyond gender. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think, again, the, the, the equal starting point being, um, you know, making that a 50-50 entree into yeah. any recruitment opportunity. Yeah, because you s we stated before that it's actually more b beneficial for a company to have a diverse team in the end, if you look at their, their outcome. Yeah. So yeah. this could be, yeah. uh, so yeah. you would say that firms should strive for uh, that in the next comi coming years? Yeah, definitely. Okay, I would just wanna look at the audience if there are any more questions. Lots Let's of see questions. a few over there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Livia. Thank you very much for the insights that you were sharing. It's really uh, absolutely invaluable. Um, you refer to uh, in your career and uh, during your uh, progress in your uh, uh, yeah in, in your career that uh, you had a, a lot of male um, help actually and support. And how do you see women and peers supporting uh, all of you in your uh, career development? And how do you see that ambitions um, women? Uh, seen sometimes 
more than actually ambitious in a negative uh, light? And how could that be also changed? So how do you see that women around you uh, as peers um, uh, actually uh, support you in, in going further in your career instead of blocking you or being a competitor? So yeah. Gera, I think it was addressed to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for your question. You know, I think I've, I've had um, certainly more encounters with men um, in more senior positions <coughs> than me, and so my, uh, uh, the majority of my role models have certainly been men and have been the people who have um, helped or blocked me. Um, and I would say a, a disappointment that I've had is that I've always had this belief that, well, women should help women. And there have been a couple of women that I have encountered throughout my career who haven't been very helpful. And that's really How disappointed do you deal with me. This? How do you deal with it? Yeah, um, every every case being somewhat different, but uh, you know, I think the the idea of a woman needing to help another woman is something that I've always felt could, you know, when you team up, you're stronger together than you know trying to go it alone. And mm -hmm. so, I always look for, you know, how can you team up? How can you really? collaborate more with that individual to help you and to align on the goals that you're trying to achieve and mm -hmm. understand if that's the person that's going to help you. If they're not, you need to move on and find somebody else who will. And I've had a number of terrific uh, uh, role models, both men and women, but I think a disappointment and really a, a, a plea to all the women in the audience is that, you know, look for the opportunities to help other women and men. Um, you know, but, but to think about um, what can you do to empower someone else? Uh, what can you do to ensure that someone else can be successful? Um, because I think if I look back on uh, the, the things that I have been able to do is, um, and Kareen stated this earlier as well, so you, so you get to a point in your career where it's time to turn and help others. And, and what can you do to influence someone else's success, to help empower someone else's abilities, and to really um, help them move forward? I think it's important that you reach that, that point where you help others. And it's it's disappointing to me to get um, to not get the help. Yeah, um, I can imagine. Yeah, would you would like to respond? I, I agree that it's disappointing, but I think that we have to be realistic when you look at the situation. And women are not perfect. I mean, they're just as human as any other human being. If you're going into a room and you have a table with ten, and there's two women there and eight men and a whole bunch of women behind you, and that's the message that you're getting. I have two spots. I can take one of two spots. I think many women in the corporate sector will then face this situation where they're not very sisterly or very supporting, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. So here again, we have to start from a balanced position where you have an opportunity where you know that you're in a culture, in, in a corporate culture, where really your uh, qualities will be taken into perspective and you will not be having to compete with the other 20 women for two positions. To prevent you know, women from I can feeling totally that they have to prove themselves. I can understand that in my career has not been in the corporate sector. It's always been within women's rights organizations and then with companies and, and organizations that I created myself. Um, but I, I understand that, that situation. Now, that being said, I think um, saying that I think we should definitely try to help everyone and be kind to one another. Mm -hmm. But I do understand why you have this sort of revolving situation where mm -hmm. the few women who make it are not very nice to the rest. Yeah. You know? Well, I've actually, uh, uh, since I joined TEDx Amps and Women, my partner is from Suriname, so I am in a diverse environment, you know, automatically. We have about 60 women working with us, and I really feel that I found my tribe with TEDx Amps and Women, and it really reminds me of my Wales College years, because I remember I was surrounded by a thousand very smart, bright, fun women for four years, and I remember graduating and our president said, you know, I really hope one of you becomes president of the United States. Well, it almost happened two years ago with a <laughs> woman from another women's <laughs> college, but I think it's important that women feel comfortable with one another. And it's so true what you say. I mean, I have really, I've had the worst experiences with women, more than with men, you know, blocking me and backstabbing. And so we are the, yeah, we are the change. Yeah. Um, is there any other audience question? There See your one in the front. So, in one of my previous jobs, um, the week that I started, um, a guy started uh, in the same position, but a slightly different as me. And in that week, I found out that um, he was making around 150 euros more than I was, which didn't make sense to me. So, I looked on his LinkedIn, I asked him some questions about his previous experience, and I realized that we had basically the same experience. It wasn't really comparable. 
Um, but also it wasn't more experienced on his side. So I called up my boss and I asked her, why is he making more money than I am? And she said, well, he gave me the impression that he was uh, more experienced than you are. So I explained to her, well, looking at our CVs, that's not really true. Um, so I don't agree on this. And she told me, well, I mean, if in two months you show me that you have the same experience and you can have the same ability as he does, then um, we can raise your, um, your salary. And I said, okay, that's, that's fine then, because I felt like if I go on, you know, take that next step, sitting with her and, and looking at her CVs, it would be too much. But I wonder what you guys would do in this situation. So first of all, I want to comment and just yes. say thank you for your comment and for your courage. Yeah. Um, because I think for me that underpins, uh, you know, a lot of the story here. And, you know, so earlier I was referring to negotiation skills, right? And, and so maybe his negotiation skills at that point in time were a little bit stronger towards overemphasizing his skills, where maybe you came in with a very honest, real view about the situation. Um, and, you know, and sometimes it just takes that little bit extra courage um, to help yourself get over the line. And, um, and I think the courage that you displayed, though, was going back mm. and talking to your manager and saying, you know, what's going on here? And I think you also really demonstrate, though, the, the, the struggle that we face, which is that for women, sometimes it's that much harder to say, okay, now I have to put in these two months to demonstrate that I really am, you know? And so that's the bit of the frustration is that, you know, wait a minute, yeah. we really are um, on, on parity here. And I, I hope that you are now or, or in that role became Will of be. parity with him. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's important to um, have the courage uh, to go back. I think that Indeed, that's great. And here again is the, the power of transparency, right? The power that you find out what the salaries, what your salaries, that you can discuss this. Right now, um, in the past eight to 12 months throughout Europe, all kinds of countries are taking a uh, position on pay and on making this transparent. So there's new laws in the UK, in France, since the beginning of this month, in Germany, to enforce transparency within the corporates, corporations, mm. about what it is they're paying and what is their gender uh, composition with their pay. So I think that this is where we have to go and not only stand up, but also find out what are the political parties that are promoting this. Mm -hmm. Because I think that when we start to have more laws uh, promoting pay transparency, we can address the issues. Well, and I think it's all about consciousness, because if you think about the fact, the movie on, on the base of sex, she said, you know, the 14th Amendment says men and women are, you know, are equal. But then she found out that there were 126 laws which showed that men and women were not equal. So it's all about raising consciousness. And you yeah. are fighting a battle for yourself, but also for others. On this beautiful note, unfortunately, we're running out of time. I want to thank you so much for being here, for ex uh, sharing your experiences, and I think you have inspired a lot of students in stage. So please give a warm round of applause for you. Thank you.